an absolutely gorgeous young mom goes for a hike and ends up horribly bludgeoned dead, losing vast quantities of the blood in her body, apparently brutally beaten with a rock found completely naked face up on the trail. And still, even though this happened months ago, we don't have the killer. This is a very popular hiking trail, the Ma and Pa Trail. Then, in a stunning turn, the DNA of the perp, I'm assuming she was raped, the DNA from the perp found in and on the young mom's body is entered into the DNA database and BAM! Get a hit from another attack all the way in LA where the guy is actually caught on door cam leaving the home but you don't see his face. Oh, we still don't have him. We've got his DNA. We've got a general description but we don't have him. The family is desperate to the point they're actually sending letters out to high schools hoping that a teacher can identify the killer, and so much more. What happened to Rachel Morin? Who, what, where, why, when? I'm Nancy Grace. This is Crime Stories. Thank you for being with us here at Crime Stories and on Sirius XM 111. Who murdered Rachel Morin? We also know that LA law enforcement has stated they believe this is a serial rapist that could blossom into a serial killer. First of all, listen to this. At approximately 11.23 last evening, our deputies responded to a report of a missing person. It was reported uh, by the individual's boyfriend um, that Rachel Morin, who's age 37, had headed out from her home on Old Emerton Road around 6 p.m. to go to the Ma Pa Trail. Once she had not returned as and when expected, the family was obviously concerned. Initial information from the boyfriend, again, the caller who reported her missing, indicated her car was at the lot at the trailhead here on William Street uh, behind like where Independent Brewery is, the people that are familiar with Bel Air. Um, the car was there, but she was not. Well, we're, we're at the trailhead, and this is actually where Rachel's car was uh, found last evening, one of the parking lots that accessed the Ma and Pa Trail here in the town of Bel Air. Um, and we're, behind me, you see our community policing unit um, with some of their vehicles that, save, that are able, and they routinely do, patrol different portions of the Ma and Pa Trail. Um, but today we are stepping up those efforts through the duration of this investigation. You are hearing the Hartford County Sheriff Jeffrey Geller speaking, trying to allay fears of the community, but those fears have not been alleviated because the killer still walks amongst us. And this ain't his first time at the rodeo. We know that he attacked a young woman, a young girl, back in L.A. Now, this is you're hearing Bel Air, and you might think Bel Air as in California near Hollywood. No, this is Bel Air, Maryland. So he is raping and murdering a woman with a rock in Bel Air, Mar Maryland, but his DNA pops up in L.A. in another attack. This guy's traveling. He's got to be lighting somewhere. So what do we know? I know that the family of this Maryland mom, a mother of five, Rachel Moore and her children now going to be raised without their mother, is desperate, sending letters to LA high schools pleading, begging for help to identify the killer, hoping that the killer attended high school as recently as two years ago. Where are they getting that number? So what they think the killer may be 19, 20, 21, 22, is that what they think? And why do they think that? Is it because of that doorbell cam video? Is it because of what the LA attack victim said to police? How does she describe the perp? But we know the family and law enforcement desperate no further information on the defendant, the killer of Rachel Moran, a mother of five. Let's listen to more 
of what the sheriff says. You know, her, her injuries are not consistent with any kind of accident or um, self-harm. You know, this is definitely a homicide investigation. Uh, our investigators arriving on the scene. It was clear to the first police officers on the scene, the investigators arriving on the scene. This is a homicide. I know that question was out there as well. How does he know? We know. Michael Gabriski says Morin's body was found in a pool of blood and had suffered severe head trauma. He believes the injury could have been the result of a rock. According to his daughter, there was a rock caked in blood. The Harford County Sheriff's Department declined to confirm how Morin died. We're learning more and more about how Rachel Morin's body was found. You know, you think when you get DNA, <clears throat> you're going to have the perp. <laughs> it's not that easy. But listen to the MO, modus operandi method of operation, as described by Crime Online's Dave Mack. Since the body of Rachel Morin was discovered in a drainage tunnel not far from the main entrance of the Ma and Pa Trail, Michael Gabrzewski has spoken out to the media about what he and his stepdaughter found or witnessed. The following information has been reported as fact by Michael Gabrzewski. Claim number one, Gabrzewski's stepdaughter Cecilia discovered the body of Rachel Morin in a drainage tunnel. Claim number two, Rachel Morin was lying on her back fully naked and she had brutal head trauma. It looked like her head had been smashed with a rock. Claim number three, there was a 15 to 20 foot blood trail, so it looked like she had been beaten and dragged into position. Claim number four, the right side of her face was gone. And claim number five, it looked like the killer was trying to erase her identity. With me, an all-star panel to make sense of what we know right now. But first, I want to go to a renowned medical examiner, board certified forensic pathologist, former medical examiner, Clark County. And there's a lot of Clark counties across the country, but this is Clark County, Nevada, also known as Sin City, a.k.a. Vegas. Never a lack of business for a medical examiner in Vegas. Okay, Dr. Jan Gorniak is with us. From what you are hearing, Dr. Gorniak, when I hear the right side of her face was gone, Dr. Gorniak, I normally hear that kind of language when there has been a gunshot wound, a GSW, where the face is completely blown off and you cannot identify the victim by sight. You have to do it by fingerprint. You can't do it by teeth. The teeth are gone, um, by clothing. But here, knowing, we think we know that the murder weapon was a rock, what kind of a barbaric attack on this? She looks like a model. I don't know if you've seen her pictures, Dr. Gorniak. There's one of her in a swimsuit. And this is a mother of five. I'm a mother of two. I jump in a pool fully clothed. I don't care what yeah. anybody says. No, I'm not kidding. Yeah. I'm not kidding. I wear my tights and a t-shirt. I just jump right in. Um, this is a mother of five. She looks like a swimsuit model. She's got a beautiful face. But that's not all. Devoted mother, Dr. Gorniak. Held down a job. The works. And when I saw that picture of her, I, I didn't real. I, I, I thought I had the wrong picture because how could a mother of five look that awesome? But she did. And now I hear, I understand from things the sheriff has told us that the killer bludgeoned her. And I'm going to need you on this, Dr. Bethany Marshall. Um, bludgeoned Rachel's face so badly, half of her face was gone. Right. Yes. And so we also know that she obviously she was out there hiking um, and she was also at the gym earlier that day. So she's a very fit person, um, obviously taking good care of herself. And so bludgeoned to death, you they say there's a rock with blood on it. Her half her face is, mm. is gone. So that is depending on the size of the rock. When we talk about blunt force injuries, we say her head hit something or something hit her head. So we don't know which. It could be both. But we know she was found face up. So there is a possibility that someone used this rock and hit her about the face, whether it was to disfigure her. You know, I'm not I'm not a psychologist um, in any sense, but to disfigure her, to obscure identification. Um, and then just the way they left her body. I believe she was naked. 
also with just, you know, these massive injuries of, of the face. Um, hopefully, you know, they got DNA and they, she fought back. So whether, whether that DNA came from underneath her fingernails or from a sexual assault kit, they were still able to, to gather that and also identify her based on that DNA also. Dr. Gordy, just a personal question. Uh, I, I, I could just listen to you talk all day long, and I'm sure you've noticed how sometimes I get carried away and I interrupt people. I, I just learn so much when I listen to you. When you say just go out to dinner or you're, I don't know, at church at the family night, stuff, I don't know, do people ask you about cases? Are you more comfortable talking about cases like you just did than talking about the weather or politics or anything else? Well, I... It's obvious I'm passionate about the the work I, I do, you know, giving a voice to the voiceless and able to tell their stories. But when people ask me about cases like this, um, I usually shy away from it because, you know, like, you know, EMS and, you know, first responders, what these eyes have seen. So I really don't like talking about those cases when people ask because it's really not, you know, these aren't like the best days of my life, yet alone these people's lives. So I try to be very respectful of of what their family has gone through, what this individual has gone through. Um, and it's, it's easy to talk to you, you know, when you ask me these questions and I try to make it not so quote unquote gory for, for your listeners, but I don't like talking about these cases unless I have to. You know, that's interesting. You say that, um, a friend Longwell joining me, former deputy state's attorney out of Calvert city there in Maryland, former, Assistant State's Attorney and Prince George, uh, specializing in sex offenses and homicides. Fran, when people ask me about cases, I have, you know, standard responses because I feel like it's sometimes re-victimizing the victim to tell, as Dr. Gorniak said, the gory details of it. But, you know, Fran, I want to tell the story in its entirety it's very hard for people to imagine what happens to a murder victim. They don't want to. It's so horrible. Like, when I think about my fiance, Keith, that was murdered, I know he was shot five times in the face and the neck and the head. But I don't think about, oh, half of his, half of his face may have been blown away. I've never thought that till this minute right now. I imagine him just like I knew him in life with some, like, maybe little dots on his face where the bullet entered. You know why? Because I don't want to think about it any other way. I don't want to think about what he endured or what he lived through because it will throw me in a funk I can't get out of. But when you think and when you have to show a jury, Fran Longwell, or when you go to the scene, it is nothing like you could anticipate. It's much worse. And that, that's very true. And <clears throat> some of the hardest things I ever had to do is meet with the family or the victim. And many, many families want to go over the autopsy report. And many, many families want to see the pictures. And it's very hard. You know, it's hard for me because I don't really want them to have to see that. But if they want to see it, you have no choice. You have to show it to them. And then I usually try to have some other victim advocate there with them. But it, it's, it's re you're right. It's, it's awful for them to remember what their loved one looked like at that time. The jury has to know, and we have to show those pictures to them to show where the wounds were, where the injuries were, how we know that happened. And you know, a lot of jurors have a lot of problems with that, too. Mm -hmm. And it's not that we... I don't become callous to any of this, but I learned as a prosecutor I have to steal myself when I'm discussing it in front of a jury because I've got to get through the evidence and I have to present it in a way uh, that I don't miss anything or mischaracterize anything. Um, right. Sydney, as we're talking about this, if you could show our viewers, I know a lot of you are listening, but for our viewers on YouTube, I want you to see how beautiful this woman is. and. No victim is more important than another victim. 
but I find this psychologically interesting and a lot of times I say I'm no shrink no truer words were never spoken but to Dr. Bethany Marshall uh, high profile psychoanalyst you can find her at drbethanymarshall.com Dr. Bethany I can't verbalize this, but I, I think you will be able to. I think the killer took a certain delight in disfiguring Rachel Morin. I think he did take delight in uh, disfiguring her. I mean, there's several aspects of this. If you don't have a knife or a gun, uh, if a rock is your only weapon, then you're going to have to beat somebody in the head, right? So there's a practical aspect. But I think these rapists do resent the beauty of these women. So while they're sexually attracted to them and they want to dominate and have power, they also want to disfigure and take away their beauty. But the, the final layer, Nancy, that you're alluding to is sadism. And sadism, sadism is a part of sexual deviancy. And these guys use the infliction of pain and terrorizing the woman in order to enhance their sexual arousal. And, and the reason they do that is that aggression and sexuality are processed through the same neural net. Okay, so well, wait, point, wait, what? Neural well, net? <laughs> they, I'm not saying that you're making life, me look ignorant. I'm doing that all on my own. What <laughs> are you saying? Can you please speak where we can life, understand it? Early in life, they fuse aggression with sex. What? The okay, wait, what? Are, are Early in life, the what? They, they fuse. They connect. Who? They, Who fuses they connect what? They connect together. The, ra the rapists early in life. What do you mean by early connect, in life? Like during their development. Um, like teenage years. Oh, they, listen to me. I grew up in the middle of soybean fields and pine trees. And my front store neighbor, Joy, told me what a period was. I thought it was a joke. <laughs> I'm like, no way. So I don't, what do you mean by early in life? Well, in their early development, let's say latency age, like 7, 8, 9, 10, and then throughout their teenage years, they, they feel in their heart, in their soul, in their bones, their cells, that aggression and the infliction of pain and cruelty does enhance their sexual arousal. Even as kids, there, there's a sense of inflicting pain makes them excited. That's why they may kill animals or torture animals. Like when they're six, seven, eight, they won't associate it with, with sex. But in, when they get into their teenage years, they graduate to feeling that the only way to feel sexually excited is to hurt or maim another person. Hey, That's Dr. Bethany, have you ever treated a sadist? I have, actually. And I, it was one of, a very interesting experience. It was couples therapy. And I said to the man, you know, you're being very cruel to your wife. And he said, I know. And it was a, a lesson in sadism because the pleasure associated with being cruel to her was palpable. And I did wonder what he was doing in other areas of his life in terms of uh, sex, rape, or whatever. I, I Just curious, I did they get a divorce? Briefly. Absolutely. Ooh, they I hate did. to think of that woman stuck with him the rest of her life. Okay, off well, your... He was a raging alcoholic, and he, he um, hid alcohol everywhere in the house, even in the back of the toilet, the toilet tank. So he was a very devious guy. Okay, and enough about your uh, well-heeled <laughs> rodeo clients. Uh, let me get back to Rachel Moore. But although, Dr. Bethany, I could listen to you just like Dr. Gorin, all, Dr. Gorniak all day long. Um, it, it, going into the mind of this killer is kind of scary. When I hear what Dr. Jan Gorniak says, and I couple it with what Dr. Bethany Marshall and Fran Longwell are saying, it's painting a horrible and horrific picture of this guy. And remember, he's walking free. We've got his DNA, but we don't have him. He could be anywhere between Maryland and L.A., 
I guarantee you he's been back to both jurisdictions. So what more do we know about what happened and what is happening to find this guy? Take a listen to the sheriff. Hi, this is Hartford County Sheriff Jeff Gaylor. It's been four days since Rachel Moran went missing and three days since her body was located, the victim of a violent homicide. Currently, there are 10 investigators assigned to our Criminal Investigations Division who have been and will continue to work around the clock on this investigation. These detectives, along with forensic investigators and crime analysts, have been scouring every detail of the days, hours, minutes, and seconds before Rachel died in order to put together the pieces of a comprehensive timeline. And more. have continued to get centers around whether we have interviewed the boyfriend in this case. The answer is yes, we have, along with many other people who are close to Rachel. That is the way an investigation is conducted. We start with people who are in her close inner circle and others who have made known her or she have encountered and work outward. Please be safe to take care of each other. Watch out for each other. Together, we will solve this crime and find the heinous coward who took Rachel Morin from her family and friends. Okay, what I learned from all of that talking is that the boyfriend has essentially been ruled out. That's what I'm hearing, and the DNA confirmed that. Joining me, in addition to Ron Bateman, a former homicide and undercover narcotics agent, Vincent Hill is with us, anchor reporter, Fox 45, in Baltimore. Vincent, this happened back in August, the beginning of August, September, November, December, January. You know, when you've got somebody's DNA, you'd think you could catch the killer, right? Yeah, Nancy, that's exactly right. But unfortunately, you know, I just checked the temperature. It's 22 degrees here in Maryland, and that just tells you how cold this case is. And to give our listeners an idea of why he hasn't been caught, Yes, his DNA may be in CODIS, but my former law enforcement training, investigator training, tells me if his DNA is in CODIS, if he's never been arrested, no one can put a name with that DNA. So until this guy does something where he is arrested and they check his DNA, he could be floating around just like Otis Tool, one of the drifter serial killers, did for years, killing people up and down the United States. That's a really good point, Vincent Hill. Joining me right now, a former sheriff that has gone to the scene where Rachel Morin was raped and murdered and has evaluated it in intense detail. With me, Ron Bateman, as I said, former homicide undercover narcotics agent. You can find him, amazingly, at ronbatemanbooks.com. He's the author of a crime trilogy. Just solving crimes wasn't enough for him. He wrote an incredible trilogy called Silent Blue Tears. And he has produced a documentary in all of his spare time on the Capitol Gazette newspaper murders. It just aired. And again, you can find him at Ron Bateman Books. Ron Bateman, I want to hear, first of all, congratulations on your books Thank and your you. doc. But what can you tell me about this scene. And I'm worried. Months are slipping by. Instead of heating up, typically a case cools down. Yeah, the scene was in a very barren location, you know, wooded area, not far off the, of the, the town of, of Bel Air. And uh, it, there, there was plenty of places for this guy to hide, do his damage. Um, before I forget about it, Nancy, I want to offer a question real quick to Dr. Gorniak. Gorniak, based on Dr. Gorniak, based on your experience, the injury to the victim is on her right side of her face. Would you agree with me that in a, a fit of rage, the attacker is going to use his strong arm, which would make him predominantly left-handed? Would that fit with you? That, that could be, but then you will have to also make sure that, like I said, blunt trauma could be her head hitting something. Did they grab her from behind and throw her down? You know what I mean? So but no, could be Dr. Both Gorniak. From the left side. No, Dr. Gorniak, of course, with all my medical knowledge, I dare <laughs> say no to you. But for her, I agree, but for half of her face to be missing, that's more than falling on a rock. Right, right. And also, enough, and it's probably more than one blow. That's also what I'm, oh, I'm yeah. saying. Yeah. So it's definitely more than one blow. 
but you know, we can yeah, we can speculate that it could be from the if they're facing each other and it came from the the left side, or you know they're on they're on top of her, she's face down and they're just you know hitting her head against against the rock, or she is on her side and that's the side that's up and they're using the rock about her face. So it it would be difficult, but that's something to to look at when you're doing you know, a, a, a profile of, of somebody, yes. I understand that Bel Air, Maryland has about 10,000 people. That's a relatively low population. Normally, uh, back to you, Ron Bateman, uh, former LE law enforcement and author, normally a smaller population would mean a lot less suspects, but we know this guy had been in LA, so he may not be a local. But he knew about a local Correct. path, which makes me think he was staying in that area. Yeah, and I have to address this. These, these are some really significant points that we need answers to. Where is the composite sketch? There was a person at the door with the bad guy as he was leading the home invasion. Where is the composite sketch from that victim? We haven't seen his face from anybody out in L.A. And really... I'm telling you, when I was a homicide detective, my sergeant would have had me at desk in the LAPD office working hand-in-hand -hand with them. I want to know, you know, the guy was in shape. Have hold we on, all hold the, on. Have, have you looked at that doorbell cam, Ron Bateman? Oh, yeah. Because it happened at night. How do I mm -hmm. know it wasn't dark in the room where the L.A. home invasion rape victim couldn't see him? I agree. I agree, but there's also someone walking him to the door, it appears. There's another right. body in that door. You're case. absolutely right, because when mm -hmm. he leaves, you see a hand at the door. I agree. So there should be some kind of a composite, composite sketch, something. Fat face, skinny face, big nose, you know, whatever. There should be something out there that we can have that the Hartford County Sheriff's Office can use um, but look at his body. He appears to be in shape. Have they checked all the gyms in a 25-mile radius? He's got a phone in his pocket. He's got a job. He pays for that. Have they checked the local businesses? Um, those things I really would like to know. You his know, another stop. thing that could have, needs to be done, I don't know if it has been done, is what I call a data dump. And we've seen it happen. I, I think mm -hmm. it happened in the Brian Koberger case where cell phone usage around the quadruple murder scene of the Idaho University students, all the cell phones being used in that area between, say, 1 a.m. and 6 a.m., you can get that from a Stingray uh, device. All the cell phones, and then you start, and, and it's a task, but you can do it. And on this trail, was his cell phone with him? Did he have it turned on? Same thing in L.A. I'm looking at the doorbell cam right now, which I would like to show to the viewers. You see him coming out. It's a neighborhood with, uh, I would say, uh, a fairly nice suburban home. You see him, a little wreath on the door. He comes out holding his shirt in his left hand, mm -hmm. and he is using his right hand mostly. But he doesn't have a shirt on. Uh I'm just curious if they've done a cell phone data dump. Good point. And look at his hair. His, his hair, have they checked with all the hairstylists in a 25-mile radius from that scene? Hairstylists know the back of someone's head. They cut their hair all the time. And that would be a basic thing but that they have to do. And we just don't know what they've done out there in L.A. Because the answer lies out there, I believe. It would really help us. Guys, we're trying to get to the bottom of who murdered Rachel Morin. Now we know DNA was taken, but we also know a little more that's going on. Take a listen to Sydney Sumner, Crime Online. Police still don't have a suspect in the Rachel Morin murder, but they do have DNA. And according to the Hartford County Sheriff's Office, they have matched the DNA to a home invasion and assault of a young girl in Los Angeles. Fox News reports that C.C. Moore, a DNA detective with Parabon Nano Labs, says the person has not yet been identified, but he is responsible for two separate crimes, creating the perfect application of investigative genetic genealogy. In this, traditional DNA analysis and public records are combined to build family trees that allow investigators to close in on suspects. 
Moore says genetic genealogy has been used to close cold cases, but she has advocated for this to be used in current cases and suspects the FBI is using the method to find Rachel Moran's killer. In other words, while we may not be able to get his DNA out of the DNA database, you can use genealogical DNA, genetic DNA. You plug it into public genealogy websites. You know those people that trace their family tree back to the Mayflower? Uh, them. People that use genetic genealogy on public sites. You plug this DNA in, the killer's DNA, that was obtained from the murder scene and the rape scene in L.A., and you see if you get even a partial match to somebody that has researched their family DNA, their heritage, then you start working down until you find somebody that was in that area at the time of the murders. Now, remember, there have been a lot of murders and rapes where it took time to find the killer based on DNA. And I'm referring specifically to, for instance, Karina Vetrano. Take a listen in our Cut 111. Karina Vetrano and her father usually jog together, but on this particular day, his back was bothering him and he couldn't go. Bill Vetrano, a retired firefighter, asked her not to go, but it was still daylight. She felt safe. When Karina Vetrano didn't return, her father called police and went looking for her on the trail they usually jogged. He found his daughter, face down on the ground, dead. He called EMS immediately. After a six-month manhunt, police arrested 20-year-old Chanel Lewis. He confessed to the rape and murder of Karina Vetrano. There are so many similar cases, uh, but let's talk about Eliza Fletcher. The DNA of her killer and rapist was already on file, but nobody knew it because that rape kit had never been analyzed and was sitting on a shelf. Listen to Dave Matt Crime Online 114. Eliza Fletcher likes to go out for an early morning run in Memphis. Fletcher was jogging down Central Avenue around 4.30 in the morning when investigators say she was approached by someone who forced her into a dark-colored SUV and drove off. Security cameras in the area of where Fletcher was jogging helped police narrow their search. As community members and police search for Fletcher, detectives in South Memphis find the body of Eliza Fletcher yards away from where police say 38-year-old Cleotha Abston came just hours after the abduction of Fletcher and washed his clothes in his brother's sink. Abston is charged with especially aggravated kidnapping and evidence tampering, as well as murder. DNA match. The family of Rachel Morn is not waiting on genetic genealogy, which could take a really long time to apprehend her killer, leaving five children without a mother They've also hired a criminal profiler. Listen to Dave Mack, 93. Rachel Morin's family is working with profiler Pat Brown to provide more information about the possible suspect in Morin's murder. The possible suspect is Hispanic, early to mid-20s, 5'9", about 160 pounds. Profiler Pat Brown adds, this person is likely narcissistic, lacks empathy. He's manipulative and a pathological liar. Speaking with WMAR2, Matt McMahon, father of Rachel Marin's oldest child, Faye, says they're trying to get as much personal information out to the public in the hopes that someone will recognize him and call police. Someone out there does know that person's name. Someone's going to look at that video. Someone's going to look at the still shots from the video. Um, and, and I'm as frustrated as everybody else. I read the comments on social media. Um, where's the other side of his face? If, if we had it, we would put it out there. Uh, we just haven't obtained it yet. Hopefully there's some additional video footage that will come our way. But off of what's there, off of his build, off of his walk, off of his um, appearance, there's someone out there in the world who knows exactly who that person is, and we need that person to tell us so that we can get a match on the DNA and put this monster behind bars. So will a criminal profiler be able to solve the case, to be able to help solve the case? What's your experience with criminal profilers, Ron Bateman? It's just another tool. You know, we use the behavioral analysis unit out of the FBI. I've done that on a few cases. Um, it's just another tool to, you know, to add to, you know, your, 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 your pile of, of, of goodies for your suspect. And what about it, Fran Longwell? You tried a lot of homicide cases, and you're joining us from this jurisdiction of Maryland. What do you make of a criminal profiler hired by the family? <clears throat> I've never used a profiler. 
but I have had cases where uh, I was I was doing reconsideration, and the day before the police called me, my detective called and said, "Hey, we just got a hit on this guy. He has another first degree rape 20 years ago, and it was a DNA hit. And the only reason they had it was because it takes a long time to run all those cold cases through the system, and when they're running through the, the old cases through, that's when they get the CODIS hits." So we wound up getting him, but that was after 20 years. It sometimes takes that long. Like they said, he's got to be arrested before you can get that match matched. I also, Vincent Hill, have never used a profiler to solve a case because very often no. I can deduce already what they are saying. Like I can look at the video and tell a lot of what we are learning, but there are insights to be gained. It also tells me the family is getting desperate now approaching high school teachers. Take a listen to Hour Cut 101. This is Rachel Bonilla. Morin family attorney Randolph Rice told CBS News the reason the family is reaching out to schools in Los Angeles is the suspect could have been in high school as early as two years ago. They are hoping a teacher who taught him and saw him every single day during the school year will recognize the suspect. According to Rice, the crime has not been covered in the Los Angeles area the way that it has been covered in Maryland. They are hoping someone unaware of the search for the suspect will recognize the person on the flyer and reach out and share information that could lead to the capture of the suspect. And the family is making homemade flyers begging for help. Take a listen. Even though an arrest has not been made in the murder of Rachel Morin, investigators do have information about the suspected killer. DNA from the Morin crime scene linked the suspect to a home invasion and assault in Los Angeles in March of last year. Using that information, the family of Rachel Morin have sent letters to high schools in the Los Angeles area, hoping a former teacher will recognize the suspect. The Daily Mail reports the family created a flyer using still images from the doorbell camera footage of the suspect leaving the scene of the home invasion assault in L.A. and sent out 10,000 flyers to homes near the L.A. crime scene. The flyer asked for help identifying the person with a message from Hartford County Sheriff Jeff Goller. This suspect will kill again. To Vincent Hill joining us, anchor reporter Fox 45 in Baltimore, this jurisdiction, former cop and private investigator, author of Playbook to a Murder. Vincent Hill, what do you think is happening now and what should be happening now? Yeah, Nancy, like you said, the family is very desperate in those letters out to those high schools, you know, saying that he could have been in high school within the last two years. We know the the approximate age of this suspected killer is in his early 20s. So if you subtract that 18, 19, he could have graduated from high school. But there is a problem with that, Nancy. And here's the thing. Just think of how close Los Angeles is to Mexico. And we do know that this suspect is of Hispanic descent. So it's a, a great tool to try to go after and identify this guy. But I would not get my hopes up saying that this is going to lead to this guy's name of who killed Rachel Morin back in August of last year. Ron Bateman, you've seen the scene and evaluated it. What do you think? I, uh, I, I agree, and, and Vincent will definitely uh, probably agree with me on this one. Why in the heck, this is so frustrating, is, does it take the family and their lawyer to do all this police work? What, that's why I said earlier, what police work is being done out in LA? What is the sheriff's office, you know, are they, do they have a desk sitting in, at LAPD? Are they working hand in hand? I don't know that. I'm not going to bash anybody, but it just doesn't seem like they're doing their work um, to really try to solve this case. I think it's it's right in front of them if someone just puts the time in. Vincent, do you agree with that? Oh, I, I agree 100%. I'll, I'll go further off what Ron just said. Like, Nancy, imagine he was caught on rain camera leaving the house. You look at it affluent neighborhood, there's probably ring cameras that would have captured his car, would captured a license plate or at least mm -hmm. a vehicle description, which way he fled. So there's a lot of missing tools here to this investigation that we don't know if LAPD is actually looking into. We also understand the family has drummed up thousands in reward money. Take a listen to Sydney Sumner Crime Online. It's cut 96. 
The law firm representing the Morin family, Rice, Murtha, and Sources, has announced that after the law firm doubled the reward to $20,000 for information leading to the capture and conviction of Rachel Morin's killer, an anonymous woman from Bel Air, Maryland, has contributed $10,000, bringing the total reward to $30,000. Based on the DNA found at Rachel Morin's crime scene being matched to a home invasion assault in Los Angeles that provided a video of a possible suspect, investigators believe the suspect is about 5 feet 9 inches tall, around 160 pounds, in his early to mid-20s, and of Hispanic descent. The reward now up to $30,000 for info leading to the arrest of Rachel Morin's killer. And is there a lead, a potential suspect in Washington, D.C.? Take a listen to Nicole Parton, investigative reporter, Crime Stories. Months after going for a walk on the Ma and Pa Trail in Hartford County and never returning home, the murder of Rachel Morin is still a mystery. DNA was found at the crime scene and matched to a home invasion in Los Angeles five months earlier. But investigators are still not sure who the DNA belongs to. The only evidence made public is a video of the man they believe is the suspect leaving the home invasion scene in L.A. But now WMAR2 reports investigators are following up on a lead in Washington, D.C., and even though detectives aren't calling the person a suspect, the hope is this person can point them in the right direction to identify the person as a suspect. If you have information or think you have information on the killer of Rachel Morin, please dial toll-free 888-540-8477. Repeat, 888-540-8477. Seven, seven. Goodbye, friend. Guys, thank you for watching Crime Online with Nancy Grace here on YouTube. To get the very latest, subscribe to Crime Online here.